Joshua Gray. Um, oh, can you hear me? Sorry. I'll project one. Um, I believe the last couple of weeks you guys were the administrator of Joshua one and two about leading the change, and that's really the anonymous. Mm -hmm. All right, mostly nods, mostly nods. Um, so quick, quick, quick Joshua background. Moses has just passed away. Moses, the leader of the Israelites, he's just passed away. His um, one of the people who was under him, I want to say like his mentor, if you will, the person brought him, he's been training with him the whole time. He's about to take charge. Joshua 1, um, you know, it's fellowship between Joshua and the Lord, giving him this divine uh, calling, giving him the path he's about to walk into. Joshua 2 is preparation for that. And Joshua 3, which is what I'm about to get into, was the obedience to the word of God that he's speaking to him right now. So just to give you some context of what's, what's going on in the whole book of chapter of Joshua 3. Um, so yeah, coming into chapter, chapter 3, verse 1, I'm going to go ahead and just read really quickly. I apologize. I tend to talk fast. I'm going to do my best to make conscious choices slow it down. But if I start speeding up, just make a wave or a head nod or something, but you know, it's home. Yeah, that, that works. Mm -hmm. That works perfect. I apologize, but for those of us who came in late, would you please introduce yourself? Again? I'm so sorry. My name is Shari. Hi. Hi. Hi, Shari. Um, I go to ALSC down the street. Um, I volunteer in the young adult ministry, phase two, one of the leaders in the ministry. Um, yeah, um, my last story is coming so I'll leave it with that. <laughs> Thank you. You're welcome. So, yeah, I'm getting right to the work. Um, Verse 1. Then Joshua rose early in the morning, and they set out, come on, and they set out for Acacia Grove and came to the Jordan. He and all the children of Israel and watched there before they crossed over. So it was after three days that the officers went through the camp, and they commanded the people, saying, When you see the Ark of the Covenant of the Lord your God, and the priests and the Levites bearing it, that you shall set out, set out from your place and go after it. Yet there shall be space between you and it, about 2,000 cubits measured. Do not come near it that you may know the way by which you must go, for you have not passed this way before. I'm going to pause right there. A couple of things going on right now. Um, the Ark of the Covenant is a, it's a, it's a really elaborate and beautiful box that they created. I, I think like half of Deuteronomy talks about just the makings of the Ark of the Covenant. It's really intricate. It's really detailed. It's really it's very specific in nature. And it holds in the Ten Commandments, and it holds in a couple other things that are sacred to the Israelites. And basically, the, let me use this for an example, it's much bigger than this, but the box itself represents the presence of the Lord. And so that's how they treat the Ark of the Covenant as such. It represents the physical presence of the Lord. Um, and so what they're saying in, um, when you see the Ark of the Lord or the presence of God, you see it going before you, that's when you're going to come out and you're going to follow the presence. So when I read that, God put in my spirit that when I recognize the man of God or the woman of God or the presence of God or anything of the Lord, and I recognize that, that if I'm in fellowship with God and I can hear his voice and he knows my voice, so we have that communication, we have that relationship, when I see that presence of God moving, that's my cue to go follow it. Because whatever God is calling me to do, it's right there. That's, that's the path for right now. You know what I'm saying? And we all have different paths. We're called for different seasons to do different things. Amen. Um, so, yeah, that's what's going on until verse 3. Verse 4, where it says there shall be space between you and it, about 2,000 cubits. Um, the cubit, when I did blue research, was about the length of a man's arm from, like, the wrist to like the shoulders, about 2,000 arm lengths, if you will. Mm -hmm. And that is to keep the people's distance because, like I said, the Ark of the Covenant is recognized as uh, being recepted as the presence of God. And so you must keep your distance from it. And if you don't have to flip there right now, but if you're taking notes, go ahead and write down Leviticus 3 and 10. And um, what that story is about, it's about the sons of Aaron named Nadab and Abihu. And the sons of Aaron, Aaron's a priest. Moses' brother. He's a priest. His son's a priest. And at this particular point, they're going to the, they're in the, uh, the tent, they're in the tabernacle, and they're about to give an offering to the Lord. And like I said, how the Lord is very specific in nature when he's telling people to do certain things for him. And so there's very specific rules and procedures for lighting the fire that they're about to give for the offering at this time, in Leviticus 10.3. And what happened was the two sons decided that they don't want to go get the specific fire that God has commanded them to give, but they're going to offer up the fire that's convenient to them, which in God's eyes is called profane fire. And what happened was, as a result of not following the commandments of the specific fire, the consequence for that for them was death. And so you got the two sons who are priests, 
And I want to emphasize the fact that they're priests because these aren't people who didn't know better. These aren't people who are newly Christians or baby Christians who, you know, simply made a mistake out of ignorance. These are people who knew full and well what they were doing and chose to take a different route other than what God called them to do. And so the result for that was death. And so you have Aaron grieving his sons, and um, he's mourning and wailing. And right then, Moses speaks to his brother, and he says, um, Moses said to Aaron, this is what the Lord spake to me, saying, by those who come near me, I must be regarded as holy. And before all the people, I must be glorified. So coming back to where we are in this text, Joshua 4, keeping the distance was very important because this is the presence of God. And it puts you in a place where it's like, I recognize God. We have a relationship. We are in fellowship. But I don't want to get into a point where I'm so comfortable that I start taking things for granted. And I don't remember the holiness of God. And I don't start taking advantage of the holiness of God. Amen. You understand? That's right. So, yes. Going right on to. <laughs> I'm good. <laughs> Amen. Verse 5. Um, and Joshua said to the people, Sanctify yourselves, for tomorrow the Lord will do wonders among you. Um, pausing right there. Sanctify yourself is a divorce from anything unclean. And what, a, what, a, what I got out of the scripture is that. It's not referring to a direct sin, like, you know, you go out and commit murder. It's not a direct sin. It's more of a, the gray areas in life, like the types of music you listen to, if you put it in today's term, the type of music you listen to. It's not necessarily a sin to listen to a certain kind of music, but you know the kind of music that would have a different effect on your spirit than what the Lord's calling you to have right now. Mm -hmm. Things like that. Certain kind of movies, you know, I'm going to go ahead and throw it out there, The Hangover. It's funny. I know, because I saw it. But... I'm saying when you when I want to get if I'm gonna like if I'm coming to speak today, am I gonna spend my morning watching the hangover in the 40 year old virgin? That one I'm gonna fill myself up with as I'm preparing myself for a battle for a calm glorious hiding from right now. No, you're not. You wanna sanctify yourself. You wanna move out all uncleanness, not just the blatant sin, but the areas that are kind of gray and that could be a stumbling block, even not for you, but if someone else sees you doing it. You see what I'm saying? So it's not just for yourself you're doing this, you're doing it for the people around you so that you can come together in unity on one accord and all cleanness. Amen? Amen. Amen. For the battle coming up. Um, verse 6, And then Joshua spoke to the priests, saying, Take up the Ark of the Covenant and cross over before the people. And so they took up the Ark of the Covenant and went before the people. And then the Lord spoke to Joshua, uh, This day I will begin to exalt you in the sight of all Israel, Israel, that they may know that as I was with Moses, so I will be with you. You shall command the priests who bear the Ark of the Covenant, saying, When you have come to the edge of the water the, of the Jordan, you shall stand in the Jordan. And so pausing right there, verse 7, the Lord's promise and the Lord's command go hand in hand. The Lord is not going to give you promises of grandeur, promises of deliverance, promises of the house, promises of all these things you're asking for without a commandment that follows it. Because he wants to know that you're in it, not just for the stuff, but you're in it for him too. So if you're seeking God for deliverance for something, I don't know, smoking cigarettes. God, deliver me from cigarettes. Deliver me from these things I'm putting into my body. Help break the, 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 the hold of nicotine off my mind. Great. I'm going to do that. But there's a commandment that's going to come with that. You don't, you know what I'm saying? You're not just going to be, okay, great, I'm free from cigarettes and now I can go live my life. you got a testimony. Because there's a whole lot of people who are dealing with something as simple as smoking cigarettes, been safe for 20, 30 years, still doing it. You know what I'm saying? Mm -hmm. That testimony needs to be spoken because a lot of people, especially in the church, who are still dealing with things that they had when they came to the church 20, 30 years later, they're still dealing with. They may, they may, they honestly may not be aware that there are some things that can be broken. Because then you when you're in the world, or when you okay, I'm gonna I'm sorry. When you come into the body of Christ, you still remember who you were in the world. And you thank God, you come into my heart, you're my savior, you're my Lord, you're my master. I thank you for all these things. And now the next step, which for some reason keeps getting overlooked, you've got to start walking in that path and purpose and destiny, which means you need to start letting all that stuff you came in with, mm -hmm. that stuff's got to start dying off. Hallelujah. You can't keep walking in Christ the way you were the day you came to Christ. Again, I'm not talking like if you just got saved this weekend or, you know, maybe in a couple of years. It's a process. It's a, really, it's a real process. Mm -hmm. But don't forget, it's a process. Progress. Amen. Okay? Amen. <laughs> Amen. So, yeah, that happened. So, going on to verse 9. Right at verse 9. God has made the promise. God has given the command. Joshua's response to his obedience. The first thing he does, after he's given the promise, after he's given the command, he obeys. So Joshua said to the children of Israel, Come here and hear the words of the Lord your God. And Joshua said, By this... 
By this you shall know that the living God is among you, and that he will without fail drive them out before you. The Canaanites, the Hittites, the Hivites, the Perizzites, the Girgashites, and the Amorites, and the Jebusites. I know I'm murdering some of those names, <laughs> but the point is that's a whole list of enemies that are coming after you, that are coming after the uh, children of Israel right now. And two things about verses 9 and 10. The obedience factor. Mm, come on. What exactly is obedience? Obedience is the response of faith to any instruction from God. Mm. Any instruction from God. Not just the ones you want. Mm -hmm. Not just the ones that are convenient. And I'm ministering to myself right now. <laughs> not just the ones that you know are going to be easy to do. Mm -hmm. Obedience is the response of faith to any instruction from God. And Jesus in the New Testament, when he taught that faith, true faith is always going to be manifested in obedience to God's will revealed. Because to stand up here and say that I receive Jesus by faith or I receive all these things by faith means nothing if I don't show some sort of obedience to it. Because that's exactly what faith is. The substance of things not seen. I can't believe God for my healing while I'm still sick and still speaking sickness over my life. Come on. You know what I'm saying? You can't do that. Obedience is the active, it's the physical manifestation of your faith at work. So, and that's actually the, the nuts and bolts of the root of the meat, really, of what this lesson is about. Because it's that obedience that through the rest of this chapter 3 and on through chapter 7, that's going to talk about the obedience, how it goes through, and it talks about the story of Jericho and how that was destroyed, how the town of Ai was supposed to be destroyed, but then there was some old disobedience in the camp. And that disobedience is what caused him to not be victorious over the town of Ai, which God had already promised Joshua he could have. Yeah. How do you feel when God is saying, I promise you victory in this, that, and the other, and it doesn't show up? Whoa, wait a minute, what happened? Immediately people want to start blaming God. Well, you promised this and you didn't come through. A lot of people who know God, who know Jesus because they were in the church, they were active, and then something happened where the promise wasn't delivered on their time or in the amount that they thought it should have been delivered in, says, well, God didn't come through, so I'm walking away. I'm speaking to whoever's in the situation right now. If you're thinking about that's where you're at right now, think about this. God does not lie. So if Amen. God is promising you and you have a commandment, I promise you, the issue isn't with the promise that God gave you. Amen. Amen. The Amen. issue Come is with you following through on the commandment that came with that promise. <laughs> so you really need to check yourself on that. I'm sorry if that's coming across harsh, but we all got to do it. Word. If you're seeking word. God for yourself, if you're really seeking that relationship, whoever said it was going to be easy, is not telling you the truth. Because yes. it ain't. It's really not. Those that are willing and obedient. Amen. You got to be willing, you got to be obedient. Willing is great. Like, I want to do all these great things for God. But if I decided, you know what? I really don't feel like coming to Chafee today, to be right here today. That's disobedience. Mm -hmm. It doesn't matter if it's at Chafee. It doesn't matter if it's at Cal State. It doesn't matter if it's at Phase 2. It doesn't matter if it's in my kitchen with my mom. Mm -hmm. If God is telling me to open up my mouth and speak the gospel, open up my mouth and encourage, open up my mouth and speak life into someone else, obedience is the evidence that I have faith that whatever he's telling me to do is going to come to fruition. Hallelujah. Amen. Hallelujah. Amen. Amen. Praise the Lord. I wrote that down. <laughs> <laughs> well, we, we, we're recording it. We're recording it. So yes. you got it. That's good. Wow. That's good. <laughs> Amen. So behold the Ark of the Covenant of the Lord of all the earth crossing over before you into the Jordan. Now, therefore, take yourselves twelve men from the tribes of Israel, one man from every tribe, and it shall come to pass as soon as the soles of their feet of the priests who bear the Ark of the Lord the Lord of all the earth shall rest in the waters of the Jordan, that the waters of the Jordan shall be cut off, and that the waters come down upstream, that they shall stand, stand up as a heap. That's the promise. That's the miracle that God is telling them it's about to happen. And like I said, it's very specific that when the priests and the Levites who are holding the Ark of the Covenant, which represents the presence of God, when they are in unity and coming on one accord in agreement and obedience together, this is what's going to happen. Come together in unity. Come together in obedience willingly. Miracles happen. Miracles Mom. happen. That's right. Amen. Obedience. Mom. Miracles happen. Come together in unity. Things are happening right now. Mm -hmm. So the presence of God, which is or the Ark of the Covenant, which represents the presence of God, is leading them out, and so they're they're gonna follow that obediently. So, and when they're following the, uh, the Ark of the Covenant out into the Lord, out into the water, and then it says, "So it was. So it was." 
Huh. Boom, there it is. Amen. What happened? It what happened. Is. The promise, what happened? It happened. <laughs> <laughs> it happened. So it was. When the people set out from the camp to cross over to the Jordan with the priests bearing the Ark of the Covenant before the people, and all those who bore the Ark came to the Jordan, and the feet of the priests who bore the Ark dipped to the edge of the water, for the Jordan overflows all its bank during the whole time of harvest. The waters which came from upstream stood still and rose as a heap, very far away at Adam, which is the city beside Zeratan. So the waters went down to the sea of Arabah, the salt sea failed and were cut off, and the people crossed over opposite Jericho. That is the miracle manifested. Miracles manifested because of the obedience. Miracles manifested because God commanded and they did. Without question, sorry, without question, <laughs> without hesitation, without stopping to reason your way out of a blessing. I don't know how many people out there have reasoned their way mm -hmm. out of things God is calling you to do because there's a blessing on the other side, but you can't see it. Totally. I can't see what's going to happen on the other side, so I'm going to stop and think about it. Like, I can really outthink God right now. Like, whatever plan I'm about to come up with is going to be better, it's going to be more effective, it's going to be more fervent than what God has already told me to do. Yes. I'm talking to myself as well as I'm talking to you right now. Because that's something that I know a lot of Christians, especially young adults, especially those in education. I'm about to finish up my degree at Cal State San Bernardino on December 11th. Finally, thank you, Jesus. <laughs> it's about to be done. <laughs> <laughs> but while I was on that journey, a skill that I learned from the world system is that you question everything. Mm -hmm. Everything that comes in your ear, you stop, you question it, you analyze it, you break it down, you get to the nuts and bolts of it, and that's fine and dandy if I plan on operating my life in the world system. That's right. Come on. If I'm going to operate in the world, then yes, the world system will work. Mm -hmm. But I'm not operating in the world. I'm operating in the spiritual realm. I'm operating in the gifts of the Holy Spirit right now. I'm operating so that I can be a willing vessel so that God's work can be done. It says the harvest is plenty, but the labors are few. I'm going to stand here as one of the few labors and do my best to just let that work go through. You know what I'm saying? Amen. Let that work go through when you let God use you. Even if you don't know what it's for, wait. It's called patience. It's hard. Some of us got to learn it. Some of us have to relearn it. Someone's got to do it like a test, read it, study it, sleep on it, come back to it the next day, all over again like you didn't know what happened. Patience. It'll get you through it so that you can see the promise. The beauty of Joshua. <laughs> when I got into this whole book for myself, the beauty of Joshua is this Joshua picks up at the promise, at, the, at where the promise was that the generation of Moses didn't make it to. Joshua's in command. He is in command because there was disobedience in uh, the Moses generation because there's disobedience. People were turning their hearts away from God. They were turning towards other gods. And as a result, they didn't see the promised land that God had gave them. They didn't see it through. They didn't maintain their obedience through the promised land. This promised land right here, this is where he's about to fight Jericho and Ai and the other 31, the other 31 cities that he's about to conquer. These are the promises of God that he made to Moses. These are the promises of God that he made to the people, to that generation. But because of their disobedience, they're never going to see it. Yeah. You see what I'm saying? Amen. Because they walked up on it, because they passed up and decided, well, we're still in the wilderness, we're still eating manna, I still want to do these other things, I thank you for bringing me out of bondage, but there's some things in Egypt I really don't want to let go of, because I don't want to let go of everything in the world, I'm still holding on to things. They never saw the promise. You need Amen. patience and obedience will get you through to the promise. And I promise you, if God is promising you, he's going to come through on that. Amen. If there's any default whatsoever, I'm not trying to, well, I don't know, I'm not going to say it like that. If for some reason there is a promise made to you from God and it don't come through, don't blame God. Don't, really don't. It's going to hurt. It's going to be like, man, was I really living as holy as I could? Was I really doing all that I could? When I felt that pull, that nudge to give that extra burger that I had bought because I plan on eating it later to that person on the side of the road who looks hungry. You know, some people have a thing about giving money, but they give food willingly. You know what I'm saying? You've got extra food on you. Something's pulling you to move. Something's pulling you to act. Something's pulling you to do the will. And you stop. Expect that to have an effect later. Amen. Amen. That's right. So don't be deceived, right? <laughs> don't be deceived. Don't, be... don't deceive yourself. Yes. Yeah. Oh man, self deception is. You shall reap what you so sow. Sad. It's so sad. So, crossover, where I'm at, child, verse 16. Crossover opposite Jericho. And the last verse, then the priests who bore the Ark of the Covenant and the Lord stood, 
bore the ark of the covenant of the Lord, stood firm on dry ground in the midst of Jordan, and all Israel crossed on dry land until the people had crossed completely over the Jordan. And I'm going to leave you with a little bit of encouragement on that one, verse 17. Um, I, I know I went through that really quickly because I've heard time issues and I don't know when people have to get to class. But I'm going to leave you a little bit of encouragement on verse 17. So they've got the promise of God. They've got the command of God. They were willing and they were obedient to the things of the Lord. And what happened? The miracle happened. What is the miracle? The water standing up, similar to like Moses' part in the Red Sea. The water standing up, like the river's coming down from the big old wall. You can see it, a big wall of water from the town of Adam. I did a little bit of research on it. It says the town of Adam was 19 miles away. I don't know if it's because of all the buildings and stuff going on here, but I can't see anything 19 miles away except for these mountains. That is the only thing I can see 19 miles away. So put that in your mind. How tall does this water have to be for us to see it over here and it's going on way at Adam? Put that in your spirit. That's a miracle. That's a miracle. While you're in the miracle, while you're walking through the miracle, be mindful that while you're walking in this river, which normally is wet, is now dry, firm ground. Come on. Know why you're there. Know the reason you are walking on firm, dry ground when you know you should be in chaos right now. When you know your life circumstances, your debt, your parents, your family, the closer you grow to God, the closer you grow to God, the more he comes to you, the more your parents is in your face talking about why you at church so much, the more your significant others and siblings are condemning you. Well, you used to do X, Y, Z before you found Jesus, and now you come in here acting all holier than thou. I'm only going <laughs> to act, I'm not acting holier than thou, first of all. I'm acting holy because that's what the word told me to do. It told me to be holy. And I'm going to do the best that I can to be holy. Not because it makes other people feel bad, because Jesus told me to do it. And it's really that simple. That's right. Live righteous, be holy. Got it. I'm going to do it. Amen. Don't let no one else stop you. Don't let those rivers that are trying to come down on you, don't let those overflow and take you and pull you out of the things that God has already set up for you. Yes. Don't let your life circumstances take you out of the blessings that God has already had you walking in right now as we speak. Mm -hmm. So just take a moment and be thankful. Remember, I am standing in a river on firm, dry ground because of the Lord. Amen. And no other reason. Yes. And that is the end of chapter 3. So receive that. Be blessed. I'm gonna go